Welcome back to the Parasitology Lecture Series. The point of this lecture is to discuss pulmonary parasitosis. The causative agent for paragonimiasis is a trematode from the genus Paragonimus. The most common species of Paragonimus is Paragonimus westermanni, or the oriental lung fluke. However, there are other Paragonimus species. Paragonimus westermanni is actually seen in Korea, Japan, China, Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, Indonesia, and India. While the other more common Paragonimus species, your Paragonimus heterotremus, is usually seen in Southeast Asia and Southern China. Here in the Philippines, known endemic provinces include Occidental Mindoro, Oriental Mindoro, Camarines, Sorsogon, Samar and Leyte, Cotabato, and Basilan. More recently, though, more endemic areas were identified, which include Compostela Valley, Davao del Norte, Davao Oriental, Zamboanga del Norte, Zamboanga del Sur, and Zamboanga Sibugay. If you look at the adult Paragonimus, you can see that it is ovoid in shape. It possesses an oral and a ventral sucker, this circle here. As with most trematodes, it is also hermaphroditic, which means that it possesses an ovary and testes in one adult. As with most trematodes, please take note that Paragonimus has two intermediate hosts to complete its life cycle. The first intermediate host would be your small freshwater snails of the genus Jagora or Antemelania. The second intermediate host would include crabs and crayfishes. As a special note on its second intermediate host, the more common second intermediate host would be your riverine crab called your Sunda Telfusa Filipina. It is a very small crab which actually fits on the palm of your hand. The life cycle of Paragonimus starts when humans ingest the infective stage of the Paragonimus, which is your Metacercariae, inside your freshwater crabs or prawns. The Metacercariae travels down the gastrointestinal tract, where the larva would exist out of the Metacercariae inside the intestines, and the larva will try to reach the lungs through the peritoneal cavity and the diaphragm. Once inside the lungs, it matures into an adult worm and it would continually produce eggs. The eggs would, of course, be deposited inside the lungs and the eggs would actually be an irritant of the lungs. So the mucociliary action will actually propel it into the mouth of the humans where the human would be able to cough it out. In some cases, the sputum containing the eggs would be swallowed by the humans and it would travel the intestinal tract where eventually the eggs will be excreted together with the stool. Once outside, the unembryonated egg becomes embryonated usually in the presence of fresh water and the myricidia will hatch from the embryonated egg, and the myricidia will swim to look for its first intermediate host, the freshwater snails. Inside the freshwater snails, it will develop into a cercariae, and the cercariae will leave the first intermediate host to look for its second intermediate host, the crayfishes, prawns, or crabs. And the cycle continues. The symptoms of paragonimiasis include chronic productive cough, back pain, hemoptysis, dyspnea, weight loss, and night sweats. You can couple it up with diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, urticaria, and eosinophilia. These three are the most common chief complaints. However, if you couple them with dyspnea, weight loss, and night sweats, what pulmonary disease comes in mind. The diagnosis of paragonimiasis can be done using chest x-ray. Or can it? Paragonimiasis cases 
at clinical and radiological features comparable with pulmonary tuberculosis. And up to 51% of pulmonary paragonymiasis manifest with normal chest findings. So the question is, how important is chest x-ray in the diagnosis of paragonymiasis? Especially in countries where in paragonymus and pulmonary tuberculosis are both endemic. A problem in misdiagnosing pulmonary paragonymiasis as pulmonary tuberculosis is that some patients are getting treated as pulmonary tuberculosis for at least six months but still remain unresponsive to treatment. Imagine the amount of drugs they are ingesting which doesn't really treat anything. Should also note, however, that up to 25% of patients with pulmonary tuberculosis may have pulmonary paragonymiasis, especially in endemic areas. The definitive diagnosis for paragonymiasis is the visualization of unembryonated eggs using microscopic techniques. You can do a wet mount wherein you'll see a yellow-brown ovoid shell. The shell is actually relatively thick. You will see a flattened operculum on one end, while the abopercular end is usually a little bit thickened compared with the rest of the shell. Special staining techniques include Zill Nielsen stain, which would reveal deflated football eggs, usually brownish to reddish in color due to the stain. What is Zill Nielsen stain used for again? So, what is the advantage of using Zill Nielsen stain, which is the stain used? In the diagnosis of PTB versus just your usual wet mount. The Zeal Nielsen staining technique is more sensitive to wet mount and it prevents transmission of pulmonary tuberculosis due to the heating process of the staining technique. Microscopy sample collection can be done using three samples in two days, two spot samples, or one early morning sample plus one spot sample. The more samples you collect, of course, would result to higher rates of positives. Other diagnostic techniques include bronchoalveolar lavage aspirate and lung biopsy. This one is a PAP stain, and this one is an H&E stain. As you can see, both in the aspirate and the biopsy samples, you'll be able to see the paragonymus ova. There, there. And those four or five. The suspicion of paragonymiasis is usually done if the patient, number one, came from an endemic area, and number two, has a history of eating raw crustaceans, usually freshwater crustaceans. The sort of minor criteria would include chronic cough, usually cough greater than two weeks, bloody or rust colored sputum smear negative tuberculosis stains, and poor or no response to a PTB treatment. A high degree of suspicion for paragonymiasis would be if a patient comes in with both of these two plus at least one of these four minor criteria. The treatment of paragonymiasis has evolved. Initially, the drug of choice is praziquantel. More recently, though, the World Health Organization is recommending the use of triclabendazole. The efficacy of both drugs are actually the same. However, the dosaging differs. You give praziquantel three times a day for three days, and you give triclabendazole two times a day for only one day. So triclabendazole is simpler and thus would produce better compliance. So let's go back to our chart. We're done with focal lesions. Now let's proceed to diffuse lesions. You learned something? Feel free to share this video. And don't stop learning.